All right, team, welcome to yet another video. Yes, we've got another one posted. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, as many of you know who have either subscribed or watched uh, any of my videos before, I will use a video to answer a question many times. In fact, quite frankly, if it takes more than about a paragraph of typing, then uh, I, I'll do a short video. I'd rather talk and give an explanation than sit there and type at the computer. So this is one I'm belong to an engineering group uh, page on Facebook and great I mean there's a hundred thousand people on there smarter than me but the subject came up about lift and again I'm not the smartest person in that group that, about lift and fluid dynamics and aerodynamics but it is an area that that I am pretty familiar with and there was a question on there about how lift is generated given a specific uh, wings airfoil so and there was some uh, some, some misspeaks in there and then I made a couple comments and then some people had some questions and so I'm going to address those right now and talk about lift in general and then just post it to my page and I appreciate appreciate all you all watching and all of you subscribers out there so I'm gonna mark the little corners here make sure I keep this thing in the field of view of the camera so first of all before I talk about uh, airfoils and wings and, and the generation of lift what I want to do is just talk about real quick a little bit about uh, fluid dynamics if we have a pipe and all of this leads to answering the questions and, and I'm going to add a little bit of extra to it as well because and make it educational right as you guys have heard me say before we should always be in the business of learning that is you that is me that is everybody the best teachers in the world should always be in the business of getting better and learning and we should always be in the business of teaching others if there's something that that we know real well or we've learned something through life's experience so if we have a pipe a cross-sectional area of a pipe and there's some fluid that's flowing through that in this direction you know it's going to come out the other end of the pipe and it could be some I don't know let's just say it's a non-compressible fluid such as water running through this pipe now there's a certain flow rate associated with this we can call it gallons per minute or cubic feet per minute CFM cubic feet per minute there we go yes and again as you guys know I'm, I won't win any awards for artistry but what goes through the this end of the pipe or if it's this long and we start measuring cubic feet per minute here well unless there's anything that has changed with that pipe or the fluid itself and assuming that this is a horizontal pipe then we can expect the same the same flow rate on this back end and that's that's pretty straightforward you guys know that already it's a simple fluid dynamics it's fluid flowing through a pipe by the way air to some degree can be considered a fluid but if we take this pipe and now and in fact, let me just draw that again, draw a dashed line here. There's an assumption that what flows through this area at some given time is also going to flow through this area. And what we're really looking at is this cross-sectional area of the uh, pipe, which is, has some, I don't know, some, some given area A. And the fluid flowing through there has some velocity V. If we call this section of the pipe 1 and this section of the pipe 2, well, we can call that V1, we can call that A1, and over here we can call this V2 and A2. Well, it just so happens that V1, A1 will always equal V2, A2. So if the volume, I'm sorry, if the velocity of the fluid going through the pipe on one side goes up, well, what happens has to happen to this side of the equation? Well, it goes up, and if the areas stay constant as they do in this example, well, then it's actually the velocity that goes up. Pretty straightforward. Now, what if we redraw this pipe to something that looks like this? And this is real world. You guys can wander through uh, parts of your house and look at the plumbing, and you'll see this sometimes. But if we have a pipe now that does this, goes from a large area or a diameter or whatever you want to call it to a smaller one. Again, let's draw a dashed line here at about the point where that happens. And we've got our fluid flowing through here, and then it comes out this direction here. Well, again, we've got V1, A1 based on this cross-sectional area. But now what do we have over here? A smaller cross-sectional area. We have V2, A2. So if we draw our equation and say V1, A1 must equal V2, A2, well, for that to happen, if the area over in this equation has gone down, then in order, on this side of the equation, in order to keep both these sides balanced or equal, what must happen to that? It must go up. It must go up. So let's do a just simple, simple problem. 
Let's suppose that who cares about units right now? We're just going to use raw numbers. Let's suppose, suppose the velocity is 10 meters per second, 10 yards per second, it doesn't matter, and that the area is 10. Well, now we have a, a unit of formula here that gives us 100. Well, over here, let's suppose we cut the area by half. So now it's a 5. Well, what must happen now to the velocity in order for this to stay balanced? Well, it's simple. The velocity has to go up by tw you know, twice as much. And in fact, notice when we cut the area in half, the velocity went up double, went up by a factor of 2. And so that's what happens here. So as this fluid, and this is very important because we're going to refer back to it later, as this fluid goes through this constriction, the area, cross-sectional area of the pipe decreases and the velocity must go up in order to keep this equation balanced. And we'll refer back to that here in a little bit, and it's very important. Now, a dude named Bernoulli figured out something very interesting called the Bernoulli Principle, and in fact, the formulas for Bernoulli principle were derived later by another scientist, and I can't remember if Bernoulli was still alive or not, uh, but it was some years later. But he figured out that that velocity and pressure are proportional. This is not a two. Let me just redo that. Velocity and pressure are proportional to one another. When you talk about fluids, and air in this case is one of our fluids. So as the velocity goes up, pressure goes down. So in this case, if we've got some pressure P on this side of the dashed line, well, the pressure of the fluid over here at P2 has gone down. Why? Because the velocity has gone up. Okay? So we're going to remember that. As velocity goes up, that's a, a, a symbol for uh, related to or whatever, pressure goes down. So we're going to remember that right there. That's your Bernoulli's principle. So now, with that being said, let's take a look at a, just a generic wing. And this is the, and it's a cross section of a wing. So it's gonna look something like this. It's gonna have a flat bottom, and again, no awards for artistry, and a curved top like that. Now let's talk about wings. I'm gonna draw kind of a, a top-down view of a wing, something like that. This is a cross section of the wing, and it can be taken, and by the way, here's the body of the airplane, here's the nose, and all that. We could take that cross section here, we could take that cross section here, 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 and any one of these cross sections on almost all wings are going to be slightly different. Near the root of the wing, that's the part of the wing connected to the body, near the root of the wing, you're going to find that there's a slight twist in the wing. In other words, it's kind of canted up a little bit, and it's going to have a high, high curvature. We call that camber. High, high camber, something like that. And then near the tip, Sometimes you're going to find a wing that just looks like this. We want to generate more lift towards the root than at the tip, because if we generated lift equally across the wing, you'd have wing tips bending all the way up there, and then you start getting a little bit of turbulence or heavy gross weights. You may break the, you know, break the metal, snap a wing. So we want to evenly distribute that lift vector force across the wing. So you'll see that, and this twist of a wing is called wing twist. And the built-in twist, the angle, is called angle of incidence. So you'll see a higher angle of incidence towards the root than you will towards the wingtip. And you see this all the time in airplane propellers or on your fan. You know, if you have a, a fancy fan at home, sometimes the part of the blade, which is, in a sense, a swinging wing, you'll see a higher degree of angle of attack, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, but you'll see a higher degree of angle of incidence, more curvature, curvature than you will towards the tip, and that's to distribute the force and the pressures developed on that blade evenly across that blade. You also see it in helicopter blades. The other interesting thing here, too, is that whenever an airplane stalls, it's because the wing has exceeded what's called the critical angle of attack, and I would really love for that to happen. When that happens, by the way, the wing stops generating lift, so I would really like that to happen along the root first so that I can feel it, because you know force times distance equals moment. So if I have a loss of lift over on this wing tip, well whatever this distance is and then the force due to gravity on that wing tip, I have a much larger rolling moment when that tip stalls. But if I can control the tip towards the root of the wing where the distance is smaller, then guess what? I have a whole lot less rolling movement 
for that airplane and I can detect the stall and recover from it before it gets really dangerous. And when do stalls occur? When do we usually exceed the critical angle of attack? It's when we are slow and low to the ground. And low to the ground and slow is not when we want to have an airplane's wing stop generating lift. So back to, so that's a discussion, meaning, and the whole purpose of that is to say that this is just a generic cross, I didn't even do it right. This is just a generic cross section of a wing. Now also with regards to airfoils, I'm gonna have, this is called an airfoil. I may have airfoils of many, 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 many different designs, just like you have tires of many, many different designs. A tire is a tire, right? No, we've got slick tires, we've got snow tires, we've got racing tires, we've got tires on dune buggies so they can go, you know, uh, racing through the sand dunes, etc. So same thing, depending upon what we're going to use this airplane for, that's going to determine the design of my wing and my airfoil. Training airplanes have a little bit of curvature on the bottom and then a lot of curvature kind of across the top. And they're difficult to stall and difficult to spin. Why? Because I'm training students in there. High, high performance aircraft like fighters may have a wing that looks just like this with no curvature or an equal amount of curvature on the top, an equal amount of curvature on the bottom. Some of your aerobatic airplanes will have a curvature on the top and a curvature on the bottom that are equal. And we call this a symmetrical airfoil. In fact, this thin one on fighter aircraft in most cases is symmetrical too. If we draw a line from the very tip to the very trailing edge, and that's called a cord line, well, if we have symmetry about that line, then we have a symmetrical airfoil. And if we have a flat bottom and a curved top, that's an asymmetrical airfoil. So again, depending upon what this aircraft is going to be used for, that's going to determine the design of uh, my airfoil. So let's go back to our normal generic wing right here. Something like that. And yeah, okay, that'll work. Now remember, the wing is moving through the air. It's actually the wing that's moving, the air is stationary, but for discussion purposes, we're gonna act like the air is actually moving itself in this direction across the wing. So, and as we discussed earlier, air is basically, essentially, a fluid, and we're gonna treat it as such. So, so all the things that apply to fluid dynamics to include Bernoulli's principle, etc., cetera, um, apply here. By the way, back to the discussion we had where the cross-sectional area of the pipe decreases and now the velocity goes up. Sorry about the break right there, I'm back. So if you remember our discussion about the cross-sectional area of the pipe and how it constricted, we, we take advantage of that concept every single day. When I turn on my water hose to, to water my plants, the water comes trickling out of the end of the hose and the end of the hose has a given cross-sectional area. But what happens when I put my thumb over the end of that hose? I block off part of the end of that hose. In other words, I reduce the cross-sectional area of the exit end of this pipe of this hose. And guess what? The flow rate has to stay the same. That constant value that we had right there in our example has to stay the same. So the velocity goes up as the water goes through the little hole that I've left remaining there with my thumb. And that is why I'm able to stand a long ways away from my plants and water them with uh, my garden hose. So back to our discussion about airfoils here. So we have air coming across here and the air that strikes, you know, and you can narrow it down to molecules, you can do whatever you want. But when the air gets to the front of this, some of that air goes over the top of the wing and some of the air, in fact, let me do this real quick. If you don't mind, I'm going to redraw this airfoil in black and then we can differentiate between the airfoil itself and the flow. So here's our curved wing, just like that. And I'll draw that airflow a little bit better. So there's our curved airfoil. And now so our air, our fluid, some of it's going to flow over the top, just like the, just like so. And then some's going to flow across the bottom and then it meets up back here like so. And then of course that's not the only air, right? You got some air over the top and you got some more air. It's going to kind of do that as it flows. And then when you get down here, for the most part, you're going to have unaffected air. But because of the curvature of this wing, the affected air actually goes pretty high, several feet, maybe a meter or so above the wing, perhaps even higher, depending upon the, the wing itself. But as you get a little bit higher and higher, you eventually get to the point where the airflow is pretty much undisturbed. And that's what you're looking at, something along the lines of this. But what happens here, if I were to take this 
and just kind of make all those lines flush. We have a given area of air flowing here. And by the way, this extends down here like this. And we have a given area of flow down here prior to the wing. And the flow rate, just like we had through our constant pipe earlier where there was no constriction, is the same across the top and across the bottom long before the wing gets, get, even gets there. But what happens when we get over here? Well, now the flow, our pipe, if you will, is now constricted right here because we have a wing going through the middle of it, right? We have an aluminum skinned wing or whatever the wing is made out of right there. So we've taken a certain amount of fluid and now we've constricted its flow. And how is it constricted? Well, one is the upper surface of the wing that has constricted it. And by the way, you also have air up here. Now some of this will move out of the way, but not all of it. And the air going across the top of the wing is slightly constricted. The cross-sectional area through which this air has to pass through is now slightly less than down here. Here it is relatively unaffected. In fact, you could almost, in a way, and you see this drawn sometimes, you could almost draw something that looks like this, an inverted airfoil where we've constricted that. We've put it through a venturi is the term for that. But bottom line, however you want to look at it, you have air that is slightly squeezed up here. In other words, the cross-sectional area through which it flows has now been reduced. And what do we say when area goes down? Well, then velocity goes up. That's it. So the velocity of the air going over the top of the wing is slightly higher than the air going underneath the wing. Some people, and you'll hear this, and it's kind of drives me crazy sometimes. Sometimes you'll hear, well, the air go over the top of the wing wants to meet the air at the back of the wing at the same time. It has a further area, further distance to travel because of the curve, so it travels faster to meet here. These air molecules aren't friends. They don't know each other. They don't know that they need to meet back here at the club at 8 o'clock, uh, and therefore to get there they must travel faster. They don't know them. That's what happens. Simply all you have is air constricted above the airfoil and air below the airfoil is not constricted, so you have a higher velocity and a lower velocity. If we redraw our airfoil to something that looks like this, then we have a higher velocity here, a lower, relatively lower velocity. The air doesn't slow down, but relative to above the wing, it is slower. And what happens when velocity goes up? Pressure goes down. And the pressure relative to above the wing is high. So we're going to redraw that something like that. And in the world of weather maps, sometimes you've seen pressure maps, we can simply do this. We can call this a low pressure region and relative to the rest of the air to include that under the wing, we have a high pressure region. And what do we know about high pressure and low pressure? High pressure fluids always try to seek low pressure. This air that's under a relatively higher pressure is going to try to get to this region right here. We see it all the time on weather maps. When it's a windy day, you have high pressure air that is attempting to make its way to a low pressure area. So this high pressure is saying, man, I want to get up here to this low pressure region, right? We're trying to build an equilibrium, but what is in the way blocking it? The wing. So this relatively higher pressure air is pressing against the bottom of the wing. You can also argue or reverse that discussion and say that there's a slight vacuum here or a lower pressure region that wants to draw everything into it so the wing is drawn up into it to include the air under it. But really what's happening is if you have high pressure air attempting to reach the low pressure uh, air above the wing. If we look at a top-down view of a typical wing that looks something like this, here's our body. Again, under the wing you have high pressure. Well, that high pressure will work its way around the tip of the wing. It will, I really can't draw this uh, too well. You know, here's the tip of the wing, here's our airfoil, here's our body. That higher pressure underneath here, here's the lower pressure, it will work its way and actually attempts to get around the tip of the wing tip. It could work its way around the front and the back, but the wing is moving forward, preventing that happen. And you see this all the time. When you look out your window when flying on an airliner and you look out towards the tip of the wing during landing in high humid conditions, you'll see these little things coming off the wingtips, little vapor trails, 
and those are called wing tip vortices. It's low pressure area generated around the wing of the, 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 the uh, wing tip and what causes that spiraling effect is that high pressure air trying to work its way to the top of the wing and of course it would except what happens the wing it keeps moving out of the way and so we have this spiraling effect sometimes you'll see it on helicopter blades and propellers too if you look at old world war ii pictures on very humid days as the airplanes were on the deck revving up to full speed preparing for takeoff you'd see those blade tip vortices building up on the the um, tips of the propeller blades so what is happening is the high pressure region is attempting to reach the low pressure region. There is a wing in the way, so now the wing is being pushed up. So let's talk about now angle of attack and how does that play into this? Because that's a very common theme in, in this discussion that I mentioned earlier on that engineering page. If we take an airfoil, and again, I'm gonna draw an asymmetric airfoil, something that looks like this. If we take the very, very tip of that airfoil and the very, very trailing edge and draw a line between the two, that's a bad point, that is called the cord line, C-O-R-D, cord line. And if we were to take an air molecule and let it flow past the wing, and now here it is, if we were to trace a line segment between where it was and where it ended up at some time later. Well, the angle between the cord line and that flowing air is called angle of attack. So let me redraw this a little bit better for you. So again, let's draw an airfoil that's at an angle of attack. I'm gonna draw a wing at, at, a, at an angle of attack, something like this. Again, very tip, very trailing edge. Here's our cord line, and we're gonna extend it out here for demonstration purposes. And here's our airflow in some direction like so. Well, this angle, you can call it angle theta, whatever you want to, whatever that is, that is our angle of attack. Now, angle of attack also creates lift. In fact, this airfoil that I've drawn here is what? It's pretty much symmetrical. You don't have a curved top any more than you do a curved bottom. So you don't have any differential in pressure. There is no necessarily a high pressure region versus a low pressure region. The pressures are the same. So then how does angle of attack then on a wing generate lift? It's real simple. If I have a piece of wood at an angle like this and I strike the bottom of it with a tennis ball at a high velocity, some of the energy in that tennis ball or momentum, if you want to look at it that way, is transferred to the board and it wants to lift it up a little bit. And the, how much energy is that? Well, it's going to be the mass times velocity. That gives you momentum. And if we integrate that, we get one half mv squared, which is the kinetic energy of an air molecule or anything else striking the bottom of this wing. And I'm not gonna get into Newtonian physics, but there's gonna be a little bit of deflection that way, and then some energy is transferred to the wing in that direction. Of course, that happens, I don't know, a billion times a second with all these air molecules striking the bottom of the wing. But that is what AOA does. And what we're doing is the more that we increase this angle of attack, the more of a direct impact those air molecules are having to the bottom of the wing. If the wing is perfectly straight lined into the wind, there is no, there's gonna be no striking of air molecules on the bottom of the wing because the bottom of the wing is now not going to be exposed to that airflow. But we increase that angle of attack, now guess what? We get airflow striking the bottom of the wing and providing lift. All airplanes, I say all, I'm not a fan of absolutes, but almost all airplanes, even a, some a asymmetrical airfoil, I'm gonna draw this with an exaggeration. Almost all airplanes, asymmetrical or symmetrical airfoil, it doesn't matter, fly at some angle of attack. For example, I will tell you, typically flying around an F-16 at about 300 to 400 miles per hour, asymmetrical airfoils flying at about five degrees AOA. Uh, it's about the same for a Cessna 172. And by the way, F-16, asymmetrical airfoil, very, very thin wing. A uh, uh, Cessna 172, a high curvature on the top of the wing, relatively flat bottom of the wing, and it's still flying around at about five to six degrees angle of attack. 
and I have to fly at a certain angle of attack to generate a certain amount of lift to counteract the gravity that is pulling the force of gravity that's pulling the aircraft down. The faster I fly, the more, the higher the differential in pressures, therefore to maintain the same altitude, I need a less angle of attack to do that. So that's why during air, uh, when airliners are landing, you'll see their angle of attack, I'm, in fact, I'm gonna do it like this, angle of attack really, really, really high because the velocity is so low. When the formula for the amount of lift generated by the wing, it's got all kinds of stuff, but we're looking, this is called rho, which means density. So the density of the air and this, I'm gonna put a plus sign here. That doesn't mean we add it. It just means it's a combination of uh, density, AOA, uh, the coefficient of lift of that particular airfoil. In other words, it's designed into it. Also, we're going to add some AOA and probably we're going to add some velocity. That's very important. And that generates lift. So if I weigh a certain amount, I still need to generate a certain amount of lift to counter that weight or I hit the ground and die. So if I'm going to lower my velocity to come in and land, I need to increase some of these other things. Well, I can't change the design of the wing, sort of. Um, I can't uh, change the density of the air I'm flying through. Look, I had AOA in there twice, but I can increase the AOA. So if velocity goes down, I can make AOA go up to keep the lift the same. There's a couple other things I can do to a wing to increase the lift at lower velocities. I can lower flaps, which brings this down like that. Now, if I draw a line from the front to the tip, my cord line now actually does that and I can increase my coefficient of lift. Many flaps not only come down, but they extend back. So now I've increased my surface area and a larger wing, in other words, a larger surface area will generate more lift. I can also take the front of the wing tip and droop it down. You'll see that. And remember this wing now is gonna be flying into the air like that. So I'm forcing the air to follow that curve and meet up here at the backside. So there's some things that, and by the way, that also increases the surface area. And why do I wanna land as slow as possible? because I have to stop, right? And remember the formula for kinetic energy of something in motion is one half. It's mass times its velocity squared. So every knot, nautical mile per hour that I can reduce my speed, that's a big chunk of energy that my little bitty wheels and my little bitty brake pads on my airplane now don't have to absorb. And I wanna get even slower if I have a wet runway or slush on the runway, etc. But I digress. Remember, the discussion here is not to talk about landings, but that's how it works. And by the way, I mentioned, uh, been, uh, I think I mentioned in the post, I've been uh, earning a living, feeding the family, clothing the family, housing the family, etc. by flying for the last 24, 25 years. I've been an instructor about 20 of those years and a flight evaluator about 16 of those years. So that's kind of where I get my knowledge here on this stuff. So let's talk about something else that somebody brought up. How does a wing fly upside down then? How, how do we, and it's really called inverted flight. And many of you all said that it must be AOA to generate lift because how does an airplane fly upside down? Remember I just showed you it's a combination of AOA and the uh, curvature of the airfoil. So you are right, if I fly upside down, straight and level, just like this, I have my low region here, I have my high region there, and the high region wants to go to the low region. Here's my ground, the wing is gonna get pushed to the ground and I'm going to strike the ground if I don't do anything different, just like this. So what do I need to do? I have to fly at a positive angle of attack. Again, I'm gonna draw this very exaggerated. So there's my wing, here's my cord line, I'm gonna extend it so that we can show that angle, and here's my airflow, just like that. And here's my angle of attack, some angle uh, theta, that's my AOA. And sure enough, my air molecules are striking the bottom of the wing and the lift generated now from this wind or this air striking this wing is enough to counteract the force due to gravity and the, uh, the, the pressure differential that we talked about because now I have lift being generated down so I have to counter that. And my AOA, my lift due to AOA now is greater than or equal to the force of gravity and the inverted lift generated by the curvature of the airfoil. This is why if you've ever seen and radio control models do this all the time. If you have a trainer airplane in the world of radio control airplanes, you, you will have a big curvature wing like this. Well, you can still fly that thing upside down, 
but when it happens, and again, you will see that airplane flying around at an unbelievably high AOA. So this is why your aerobatic aircraft have a symmetrical airfoil. They have a curvature across the top and the bottom that matches. So I don't have any differential pressure across the wing. So that is why that uh, even inverted or right side up, they will fly with a slight angle of attack because they have to degenerate that lift. And how much angle of attack will they fly when upright versus inverted? It's the same amount, pretty much the same amount. And really in reality, by the way, the limiting factor as to whether or not an airplane can fly inverted for an extended period of time, it, it, some of it has to do with what we're talking about here, but also it has to do with the engine, right? Because almost all engines are designed to do what? The oil is, is pumped up to the lubricate, lub the parts of the engine need lubrication and gravity brings it down to a sump and the pump sump pumps it out of the sump back up into the engine. Well, if the sump is now at the top of the engine because I'm flying inverted, now the oil is floating to the top of the engine, nothing's getting into the sump, and now after about 30 seconds, I have a real problem with lubrication of the engine. Same thing with, with fuel. How do I get fuel from the top of a wing tank, right? Normally, the planes are designed to feed from the bottom of a wing tank. So I have to have specially designed aircraft. By the way, if they're hydraulically actuated controls, how do my hydraulic pumps access the hydraulic fluid in the reservoirs if the fluid is upside down in the reservoir? So aircraft that can fly inverted, there's typically a restriction to how long they can fly inverted. There's something else I want to talk about inverted flight. There's a couple ways to go inverted. What if I'm in just in a normal airplane and I just do a loop? I just fly a loop just like that. Well, I always have one G, 9.81 meters per second. That's the acceleration due to gravity, and we call it one G. I always have one G pulling down on me here, always. Well, when I'm upside down, if I'm doing a two G turn like that while I'm upside down, well, I have two Gs going that way, one G going this way, so the net force on my airplane and on my bottom in the cockpit is one G upward. Now remember, I'm upside down though, so what does that feel like to the airplane? What does that feel like to me? What does that feel like my pass to my passengers? What does it feel like to a glass of tea or coffee sitting on the console in front of me? It feels like this. It feels like normal flight. So you can do a two G loop and blindfold everybody, and in a sense, it would be hard for anybody to know us if you did it just perfectly. And that is how, on some of these videos and cockpits, you can see people doing loops uh, all the while, uh, pouring a glass of water, I've seen that before, or just the glass sits on, the, on the, uh, the, the glare shield there in the cockpit and it doesn't move. Why? Because we're doing at least two Gs to counteract the one G that's pulling down right here. So the airplane is indeed upside down, and indeed it is flying. But as far as the physics are concerned, it's doing nothing different than when it flies straight and level. We call this positive G. Even though it's upside down, it's called positive G. There is a positive G going through the bottom of the aircraft, through the seat of the pants of the pilot and the passengers, through the wing, through every part of the aircraft. We call that positive G. And in this case, it's positive 1G. An airplane that's flying upside down, and here's our inverted airfoil drawn terribly and of course here's our fuselage and of course the airplane looks like this and an airplane that's flying upside down and not descending or climbing has one g due to gravity pulling downward and we call that negative g flight negative g flight which is not good for most people because now all the blood's rushing to their head um, it's not good for the wings because they're designed to take the force like this not take it like that and it's not a good thing. In fact, most aircraft manuals will limit uh, negative G flight to like 1.5, maybe 2.0. I can tell you, you know, super, um, super advanced, uh, high performance aircraft oftentimes are, are have limitations that are not that. I mean, you could have a 9G limitation positive aircraft, but you roll it upside down and want to do negative Gs, you're really, really restricted a lot of times because there's so many parts of that airplane weren't designed to take the force in the opposite direct direction. So you have positive G upside down flight, you have negative G upside down flight, and then there's one more that I'll tell you about where you could do this upside down. You're flying upside down right here and you decide to just descend at the same rate 
that gravity would pull you down, 9.81 meters per second squared. That's acceleration. You could do that upside down. Now you have zero G flight. So anything in the cockpit, anything in the cabin would be floating around because really what's happening, it's not floating, it's falling, but the aircraft is falling around it at the same rate. NASA has an airplane, I think they still have it, but it was a modified seven, Boeing 707, and they call it the Vomit Comet. They would use it to teach astronauts how to handle zero G environments. So that airplane would go up and it would reach an apex and then it would just start what's called a bunt over. So the pilots are up front pushing the controls forward and the plane is descending and at the same rate that anything, would, if you were to jump outside, you would be, in fact, if you did jump outside the door, you and the airplane would be together side by side as this thing is falling. I think there's uh, some Red Bull um, videos of some dudes in some squirrel suits flying alongside the airplane. They are both descending at the same rate. So if you were inside here, you would be experiencing zero G. In some cases, aircraft that are designed to fly at negative G can't fly at zero G. Because zero G, you know, at least at negative G, if I've got a fuel tank and I have a, a line feeding from here and a line feeding from here, and at positive G, my fuel is right here, well, then I can get fuel to the engine. At negative G, my fuel moves to the top of the tank and I can still get fuel right here. But at zero G, the fuel's just all over the place in here. It's not isolated to the top of the tank or the bottom of the tank, nor is my oil. So even airplanes that can fly upside down at negative G for a decent period of time, call it 30 seconds, maybe call it 60 seconds, will be even more restricted at zero G flight. So that is a lengthy answer to kind of a short question. And that is, how does a wing generate lift? How is Bernoulli principle tied into this? What happens when I constrict the flow of a fluid across the top of the wing versus the bottom of the wing? How does angle of attack play into this? Is it angle of attack only that generates lift or is it the curvature of the wing slash Bernoulli's principle only that generates the lift? And it all depends on how the airplane is flying, the design of the airplane. What is the design of the airfoil? Is it a symmetrical airfoil or is it an asymmetrical airfoil? All those things are going to factor into it. So I appreciate you guys watching. I hope this clarifies the question and some of the misnomers out there regarding flight, inverted flight, angle of attack, etc. If you like this video, please click like. I've got a lot of other, I think, interesting stuff on my channel here. A lot of it's astrophotography centric, but I'm going to start uh, focusing also on one of my other loves and passions, and that is uh, physics from kind of a layman's, very simple to understand standpoint. Uh, but this is one of them. So if you uh, like this, I'd appreciate if you would uh, click the like button. We should always be in the business of learning. So if you've got comments, corrections, things that I need to know, please post that there. And if you've got any questions, uh, of course, post those and hit subscribe. I try to post something interesting every, at least every couple of weeks or so. Thanks, guys, for watching.